Okay, so in the interest of time, we're going to begin. As everyone um, has agreed upon, this is being recorded for Prosperity State. We're going to open up with just a short video depiction of where we started and where we're going. So thank you everyone for coming here tonight. We will now have our welcome and acknowledgement remarks by the superintendent of Sheltonham School District, Dr. Wagner Marseille. Um, thank you, uh, Mrs. Taylor. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, nice inspirational uh, video. Thank you for putting that together, um, Mrs. Uh, Taylor. I think that you had everything right. I don't know about the visionary leader uh, piece in that one. But let me let me say this. Um, uh, and I welcome uh, uh, our guests who are here with us. Two years ago, um, Ms. Taylor and I sat down and we wanted to imagine a place where we can bring students um, under an umbrella of cultural proficiency, equity, and anti-racism to build community um, and for them to be social justice warriors representing um, their school, their district, and their larger community. That's really what it was, knowing that we wanted to amplify student voice. And we wanted to create the conditions so that when there are opportunities for students to stand up and stand out, and address issues of inequality, of injustice. Um, we wanted to arm them with the necessary skills in order to do that. Uh, and we wanted them to understand what it meant to be culturally proficient. We wanted them to have a clear definition of equity, the tenets of social justice. But more importantly, what we wanted was to make sure that they were prepared so that when they met with our panelists or individuals who hold positions of influence, those who are policy makers, um, like the individuals here tonight, we wanted them to be ready to, and armed in order to present uh, what they feel are things they've waited for too long, questions that they wanted uh, answered. So as we fast forward and we realize that we started with four school districts who really were committed to saying, we're not really sure what this is about, but if you're trying to build community, if you're trying to find ways to galvanize student voice, um, we wanna raise our hands. And the superintendents and administrators at North Penn, at Norristown at, and Upper Dublin came in with open arms uh, and open hearts and open mind to help create uh, our culture proficiency, equity, student ambassadors. And since then, um, we've added four more school districts who are just as passionate and committed to 
uh, this work as um, uh, Abington's with us, Upper Moreland, Lower Moreland, and Hapboro Horsham uh, as well. So we um, look back in terms of where we started excited because we're seeing um, as fruition some of the events that have taken place, tonight's event, future events, is exactly what we were thinking about. So I want to welcome uh, Representative Regina Young, uh, Representative Napoleon Nelson, uh, Chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, Donna Bullock, uh, and I believe that Senator R. Haywood is going to be on this call or is on this call, and all the members of the Pennsylvania Black Caucus members and staff for carving out the time, because you could be a lot of places tonight. And unfortunately, um, I am double booked because I have a meeting at seven o'clock with my board, so I can't stay long, but I wanted to uh, greet you personally and thank you uh, for uh, carving out in your busy schedule of time to hear from our students, our constituents who are ready to pick up that baton and stand next to you, beside you, with you, um, as we are championing these efforts. So I'm excited um, that you are here. I'm excited for what our students are gonna be able to share with you tonight and excited with the changes that will come as a result of their voice. Um, so let's have a great conversation, a great opportunity to build community this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marseille. One of the first presentations we're going to have tonight is a, a youth perspective, a student perspective regarding fair funding. And um, two of our ambassadors, Yasir Valentine and Emily Trail from NARS Town School District will be presenting. Let me just shift really quickly. Okay, Emily, you tell me when you're ready. Thank um, you. Um, Emily, right, okay. Go ahead. go ahead, Emily. Thank you. Um, as you guys know, my name is Emily Trejo. I'm a student at North Area High School. Um, and today I just wanna focus, I wanna ask you a question and I want you guys to have this question in your mind throughout this whole presentation. The question is, um, is funding always fair? Is, um, is that fair? And just have that in your mind. I ask you guys to put on your equity lens, your glasses, and just see things from my point of view. I am a Latina in a in the North Santa Area School District. Um, and I want you guys to think about having shoes that don't fit you and running a race to success. Running a race the shoes that don't fit you, you're not going to get as far as you would as a shoe that fits you. Uh, being in Norristown as a Latina person, I want to talk about a privilege, but a burden that's been on with me like since elementary, middle school up until now. So I do speak English and Spanish. And in most of my classes at the high school in middle school, when I attended middle school, I've had to translate for other students and translate for the teacher. And I say it's a privilege because I'm, I have that um, power to help teachers and help other students, but it's a burden because it's taking away from my learning. I have to make sure that other students is okay. I have to help the teacher. I have to help um, everybody like in my classroom just to make sure that they're getting the same education I'm getting. And that's what I, um, our school is like 70% under, um, underfunded. And I just wanna jump into our school budget. So our total budget for Norristown is about $164 million. million and 72% comes from local sources. We don't have big property taxes or we don't get that many funds. So a lot of our taxes have went up 3%, especially during COVID. It went up 3% and that 3% was just to keep a staff we have now. Um, we haven't had any more. And as you know, 
money matters in education. In the United States, um, we still remain inequitable. And about 35% of the public school revenue comes from property tax. And that favors wealthier areas, while other communities rely on more state revenues. And this is a reason why non-white schools district annually receive $23 billion less than white schools. For example, at Norristown, we spend about um, $12,000 per student. In another district that's close to us, about a 30-minute drive, they spend around $26,000 per student. And with an extra, and to get like more um, staff to help teachers, uh, for example, um, get a good pottery teacher to help students, let's say someone who speaks English and Spanish um, for the EL alert students in the classroom. So I wouldn't, because with me, when I have to translate to another student, that teacher has to take, give her full attention to that student to make sure I'm translating good to them and they're understanding them. And that takes away time from other students who need that one-on-one -on -one time with other teachers. And that's taking away from, I have to make sure, do I remember this? Do I know this? Am I able to explain this to the other student? And if it's not, then I have to think of ways to how to help the other student. And that's only one example of how um, not having, being underfunded affects Norristown. An exception, an exciting example is we need more staff. We need more staff, like I just said, people who know how to speak Spanish, people who know to speak English. Um, and I just wanna talk about um, how Norristown is almost about 50% 50, 50 Latinx and Hispanic people, students there. And in our district, we don't provide second languages until high school. And I know in other districts, they provide that until middle school. And we all know that to be successful and we all know that knowing two languages is really good for the workforce to go to college and just in everyday life. And we know that we've known that for a while now, but we haven't done anything about it until Norristown, until high school. But other school districts are doing it in middle school. So why can't we do it when majority of us are Hispanic and Latinx? And we can even start that as early as elementary school. And that also goes back into paying around $100,000 to get a good teacher who speaks English and Spanish and help um, the EOP students. And that's all I have for Norristown. And I'm just gonna pass it on to Yasir, who's from Chanaham. Hi. Um, first, I just wanna give a thank you to Ms. Carmina and uh, Dr. Marseille for you know, doing everything you do around the ambassador program. And thank you to the representatives in the Black Caucus who've come out to support us tonight um, and hear our stories and what we think on our views. Um, yeah, so the budget for Cheltenham uh, School District, we have a total of, of $119 million. Uh, 94 million of it comes from taxes and the combined of state and federal is about 25 million. Um, and that's that means with it from taxes, we're paying about four times as much as combined the state and the federal, which is a, which is almost a 400% uh, percent increase uh, in revenue from taxes instead of uh, more. I, th I feel that more should come from the state and the federal government. And then I will go down to the uh, federal budget breakdown of the uh, US next. Oh, sorry. I thought I was controlling the screen. Uh, one more. Ours, my picture is not showing up. I don't know why. But um, I I have the, or right, there we go. So we're spending um, almost $600 billion on military, which is 54% of our budget. That's over 50%. We're in education, we have 6%, which is $70 million going to education. And I mean, we can just use uh, common sense where that just doesn't make sense. Why are we spending such little amounts of money on education to better our youth? Um, yes, I feel that is one thing that needs to change. We should divert money from the military budget to education and other things um, around uh, you know, personal benefit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
Uh, so these are two of the most economical uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, school districts. This is uh, Cheltenham High School and uh, Norristown. Norristown is number one. And both of these schools have over 60% uh, students of color. Um, and, and they have the most uh, economic disadvantaged students. And that just shows, um, and then next I'll go into the most um, economically wealthy uh, school districts. But um, this breakdown, yeah, now I'm going, now we have uh, Lower Marion, Upper Dublin and Lower Moreland. And none of these schools surpasses 15% uh, students of color. Now that shows the, um, how uh, mainly uh, schools that have higher percentages of students of color are economically at a disadvantage than majority uh, white schools. Um, next slide, please. And uh, now I just wanna talk about why we should be having this conversation now. Um, I feel that the political climate is right um, with our new president and all the things that have been happening over uh, the past year and a half. I feel that the political climate is right. And uh, all around Pennsylvania, there are different groups. We were one of them, the ambassadors, but there are many groups I've heard of and that I've even been a part of a little bit um, that are taking initiative and in doing the social justice uh, work. Uh, I'm talking about scholars. I've been a part of Black Men at Penn. I've been at MACU, which is a part of uh, also UPenn. Uh, these are all groups of scholars who are taking initiative and in trying to fight for social justice. And the real question is, why hasn't this happened already? Why aren't we? How, why haven't we been having this conversation at this depth with our with uh, with scholars and students? Um, I think that I'm happy it's happening now, but I, it should have happened a long time ago, but it, it is happening now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so, and the problems are, you know, we have generational um, systematic racism and oppression. Um, so for example, I wanted to bring out uh, real estate to talk about, you know, how the disadvantage for uh, uh, for families of color. So in uh, Lower Marion, the average selling of a house is $675,000. And the average income for a um, household of color is $61,000. Now, with just those two numbers right there, those families can never move into those that school district, which is the most wealthy district. And as we saw from the numbers, of the breakdown of the races, uh, there were very little um, uh, kids of colors within these schools. And that's one thing that really needs to change. And also, we need to uh, divert resources. We need to have more resources in these schools like Cheltenham or uh, Norristown that have these higher uh, rates of kids of color um, because these uh, schools like Lower Marion or um, the other ones, there they have a lot of resources and, there's, and their children are thriving, um, but other schools do not have these resources and we need to divert some of the funds to allow more, re more resources. Like Emily said, more teachers, more counselors, more social workers, we need all of these supports and resources. Uh, next slide, please. And here, I just want to talk about privilege um, in general. Uh, as a person of color, I feel that like today's society is um, education is really bound around capitalism and privilege. Um, you know, unlike uh, mainly white schools, uh, the, a lot of these uh, schools that have higher percentage of kids of color are usually in poor neighborhoods and under resourced and um, the, aren't given the opportunities that uh, these other schools have. Um, I feel that it's even similar to uh, this picture is um, a protest that was happening outside of the uh, administration building during uh, Brown versus the board, uh, board of Education. I feel that we are going kind of diverting back to this time where uh, 
their schools schools are segregated because now we have uh, schools that are, like I said before, all these schools that have higher percentages of kids of color are in poor neighborhoods. They're under resourced. They're treating school more like prison uh, than as a space to for kids to thrive academically and socially. Um, and that's one thing that needs to change. And one, and I wanted to bring up a story of my transition to Cheltenham, uh, in particular. Uh, my my uh, mother was talking to another parent, and she said um, that I sh that uh, I should not go to the school because of the influx of kids of color that have gone there. And this lady uh, was a white woman. Um, but the, because of the influx of uh, kids of color that were that were coming to Cheltenham, and that shows the ignorance and the uh, the the this topic that is not being talked about within school and within and around privilege, um, and a lot of it breaks down to uh, funds and budget and which schools are getting which resources and how we're not having uh, equity within our school district. Um, you know, I feel that if you were to take all of the funds of, um, of, the, of education and were to divide it per student, you'd have much more equity than the way we do it, where it's kind of like this lottery system. And that's why I feel that needs to, that we need to highlight and really talk about is the privilege around uh, schools that that are predominantly white and that are highly resourced and highly um, that have a lot more resources than uh, schools that have are predominantly uh, kids of color. And that's what uh, we have to say for our presentation. Thank you for listening. You're, you're muted, Ms. Carmina. I am so sorry. I was saying as we transition, um, Representative Young, could you possibly share some of your thoughts in reference to what the students presented? Yeah, so before I begin, I wanted to ask, what are the grades of the students, Emily and Yasser? Um, I am a senior at Cheltenham High School. And I am a junior at Norristown Area High School. Okay, I asked that simply because I just found it to be so refreshing to hear such young articulate leaders speak in that manner and then present. I think you guys did an amazing job. You spoke out of your truth. You spoke out of your um, passion and experience. And I, and I acknowledge that. And I do believe that you are the answer that we've been looking for. This is the platform that I think will be very helpful as we highlight those um, subject matters. I know Emily, you said the equity um, lens or equality, equal lens. It was like, yeah, equity or equal lens. I can't remember. I wrote down E and I don't know why I didn't write down the whole word, but listen, you have it. You guys, you, you're asking the right questions. I just said, why are we just now doing this? You're right, you are on track. You're asking the right questions. I will say specifically to your district, I am being educated. I am the education chair of the, uh, well, the sub education chair for um, the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, but I represent Philadelphia and Delaware counties. And those numbers are just as devastating in those school districts as well. And so I hear you and hence why most of the things that I'm working on in Harrisburg does have to do with education because we wanna make sure at least in my, and what I'm looking to make sure that I bring to, to this particular platform and like-minded students um, like yourself is the three E's and that is empowerment, education and equipment. Like we need to equip you with the platform and the education along with empowering you to have the voice so that you can not only speak to people who look like us, but speak of nationwide. It's not just about um, those people who, who look like us because the truth of the matter is for the most part, we get it. And we are on the same page and we're 
fighting the same fight. I think it would be most helpful if we continue to have those conversations with people who don't necessarily look like us because that's where the education comes in because they are, I'm learning just, I've only been in Harrisburg a few months, but I'm learning that people are just unaware of what exists outside of their immediate space. And it's not an excuse, but I'm learning that if I really want to get these particular um, messages across, um, I know Yasir had a slide, 6% of the education funding um, federally is, is 6% out of the entire budget. That's on a federal level. So obviously it's smaller on, on as we go from federal to state and to local. So I get it. The cry is real the need to have more funding and equitable funding and equal funding is real. So why isn't, why does it not exist? I don't know how political I could be, but I will say, um, you're speaking to, to myself, I'm a Democrat and I think the rest of us are too, um, Napoleon and, and Chairwoman Bullock. And so we get it, but we're not in a majority. And so what we have to do is find opportunities where we can talk to those people, have the majority of the voices so that they can hear us and help us while we're helping these districts like Sheltonham, like Norristown, like Philadelphia, like Delco. Like it really does take a collaborative effort and it's, it's bigger than legislator. I'm a mom, I am a wife, I live right in the heart of the hood. So I live these experiences every day. I see them every day. And so whether I'm a legislator or a community advocate, a student, it doesn't matter. I too want to see better. And so what I'm learning is that collectively, whatever lane you're in, we can do so much more to be impactful. So I do believe platforms like this is extremely helpful. Educating people about different things is very helpful. Like I said, I didn't know anything. I didn't know as much, I would say, about Sheltonham and Norristown, but it's these platforms. And guess what, guys? We're in it for the long haul. This is something that has to be repeated over and over and over. But the beauty is the more groups and the more people we touch with our information, the more impactful we can be. And the goal is to be more influential in our policies and our landscape as it relates to fair funding so that we can all have an equal America as it relates to education. Thank you so much, Representative Young. We really appreciate your thoughts. We're gonna move on to the next presentation. Um, we have two wonderful young ladies, Shannon from Upper Dublin High School and um, my girl Sadia from um, North Penn. And they're going to be talking about um, redistricting. And give me a second. Oops. Okay. Wow, hold on. Okay. So Miss Whoa. I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. So they are going to talk to you about redistricting. Sadia, you make it begin. Um, before, sorry about that. <laughs> um, before we start, I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone joining us, all the representatives, um, Miss Carmina for making this happen, and to all our attendees to dedicating your time to hear our voices be heard. So I wanted to start off with redistricting, and um, if we could go to the next slide. Sure. So although redistricting, we can have various voices upon redistricting, but I know something that we all can agree upon. I'm so sorry. I'm extremely sorry. Um, something that I can, we can all agree upon is that slavery is terrible and our views on slavery is something that we can all agree upon and me bringing up slavery may seem like something that is far away from re from restrictions um and uh redistricting i'm 
sorry. And, but the way that we're approaching redistricting and the way that we've seen redistricting occur is unfortunately the way we've almost seen the three-fifths compromise of 1787 occur of how we would treat certain slaves and each slave would equal to three-fifths of a human being. And it's never been that a person should ever be less than an individual. So in this time, it's really devastating to look at it that way. But the way that we're approaching redistricting is that the fact that not everyone's voices are being heard and we're basically cutting other people off and we're demeaning their actual voices and the power that they can actually hold. And that shouldn't be a political party thing because we're all humans and we all have basic rights and by taking away redistricting properly we're actually taking away the rights of humans um, could we go to the next slide so to understand how we can change redistricting is exactly to understand what is redistricting and redistricting in the sense is the division in each state which occurs when we do our census every 10 years and we divide the lines and that basically decides who gets to represent which district and therefore that actually makes um, the separation. And when this actually happens, something very, very common and something that Pennsylvania has been called out upon several times is gerrymandering. And gerrymandering is when like you have such odd shapes that you would never have thought about coming from making district lines. So if we look in the image to the right, we can see how gerrymandering is occurring to the last picture. And the one uh, uh, next to it is showing equality. And it's not that difficult to separate it that way, but because people want the advantage, many people go into gerrymandering. Next slide. So how could we stop gerrymandering? And this is something that we could have done a long, long time ago. And we could have stopped it with transparency. Like we could have in this digital era, there is no excuse for not having these meetings that are having the districts happen, like the redistricting settlements and the agreements happening, we don't see any of that. We just hear about it and we just know that this district is this and et cetera. We don't get to see what's actually happening behind the scenes. So if we do solve it through maybe having some transparency, having some people call out mistakes and them being aware that they can't really cheat their way through these things, then we could essentially no longer have political parties just trying to win over and uh, take away other people's lives in that sense. And for people, really young people like me, it's it may seem like we're too young to think about politics, but essentially, as we usually say, this there is a future laid out. So this present is what's going to be our now. And this life that we're living, although we may be seeing like very young, it still sets the place of how our life is going and our education. So we would finally see accountability and also a very, very big thing that we could also do with our technology is have uh, technology actually do our own balloting almost like the redistricting at least where that way there would not be any bias and it would be 100% fair and there would not be any political cheatery and etc. Next slide. So essentially if we don't have be creating these districts we won't really be able to have every single person that wants their voice to be heard to be heard and little issues like education or just laws that we have set those things are not going to change if the people that are quote unquote representing us don't even 
see who to who we are and it's very upsetting when you don't get to hear yourself and have no say in the country that essentially is supposed to be geared towards us next slide Okay, thank you, Sidia. So for whatever reason, this picture isn't um, popping up, but I wanted to talk about the history of Pennsylvania. So I think most of us are aware by now, but in 2011, the drawing of the congressional map is quite absurd. Um, that's really the best way to phrase it. I, I think the best anecdote to say about this map was uh, I was working on a midterm campaign in 2018, and during the summer, I had taken to, I took a camping trip out in like Allegheny County and I came back to the campaign office and I was telling the candidate, oh, this is where I went. And she told me I had been in four counties and somehow they were all a part of one district. And I mean, at the time I was 14 and that was absurd to me that there could be a representative representing that many voices. Yet it, it, it just didn't make sense. And now, of course, because we've lost one seat that is going to be exacerbated just that much more. So that is why now is the time to really put in comprehensive um, reform surrounding gerrymandering. So you go. Um, so again, the exigence of this is very important. Um, Pennsylvania is sort of, <laughs> I hate to say this, but it's sort of a laughing stock. Um, I think we're all aware of the goofy kicking Donald Duck um, map and I think Sadia and I can both tell you, just coming from a young person's view, we spend a lot of time on social media, and that picture of Pennsylvania's map is really funny as a meme on social media. Um, and I say that because that we're going to take that as a positive, and that means that Pennsylvania has the attention of the entire country. And by doing that, if we can put in some comprehensive reform, that way we can set the precedent for the rest of the U.S. Because yes, Pennsylvania is an extreme in terms of gerrymandering, but this is happening all over the country. So why aren't we like the little microcosm that can make it happen? Next slide. And again, just some more exigence is the census was not accurate. Um, COVID-19 is undoubtedly affecting these numbers and a, that is disproportionately affecting minorities. Um, I think that plays very well into the anecdote that Sidia said in that first slide. Um, this is now the time because it's disproportionately affecting minorities to such an extreme. You can go to the next slide. So for us to basically, as Shannon said, that we are basically, all the country's looking on us. And if we really try and set this step, this would actually make a cascade for all the other states to realize that, you know, they're gonna get in trouble if they they continue with gerrymandering and they don't really see what their um, each side wants. And it therefore they won't be able to actually get what they want. And if we do do this, like I said, transparency is a big thing. And with transparency, we're actually going to be trusting our legislators. And that's a very big thing because if we don't trust the other side or our side, then how do we feel about actually having our voices being heard? And if we don't have our voices being heard, nothing's ever going to change. And just sort of to end it, um, we thought it was really important just to remember to be mindful of the institutional powers. Um, we have, the well, we as constituents um, have the power to have our representatives have the power um, and political parties should not be excluding the needs of the other side, right? This goes both ways and they have the ability to do so, so much when you're in the majority yet they're doing so little. So we just wanna remember our foundation back to the roots of the United States and just again, be mindful of that institutional power. And that's it for CDNI's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Representative Nelson. Yep, oh, you muted yourself. And, uh, uh,
Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I can now. Yes. Okay. So, um, Representative Nelson, do you would you like to share some thoughts in their presentation? Uh, sure. But also, is it possible for uh, Senator Haywood to share a slide? To share a slide? Yes, I think he's got a, a slide that he would like to share. Um, wait, let's just see. Uh, Kevin? I think he's going to do that during his presentation. Right now. That's right. Yeah, so at the if, end. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, got it. Okay. Okay. Got it. That makes more sense. All right. Um, yes. So thank you. Um, and, and thank you both for, uh, for that presentation. I think that um, there are a couple items in there that you've uh, certainly nailed. One of them is the importance of the census. Um, so, you know, I don't know if they talked as much about that in school um, last year, but, but the census is a critical, critical exercise in how we are identifying who we have in our communities, right? So how we are counting ourselves. And, and as you guys mentioned, just the three fifths of a person um, and it's kind of histories we still even have issues within the census of how we count um, and the effort that we put into uh, being counted in, in certain communities, um, in minority communities, um, how we are identifying and counting those who are incarcerated um, and where that count um, goes regarding their own representation. We still have a number of issues that we are really, really wrestling with um, right now where injustices do in, in, exist as it pertains to just completing a, a sound and solid census. And obviously, as, as we oftentimes think about this year's, or I guess last year's census was also clouded with um, some significant language or at least um, you know, misdirections and controversy around immigration status, which only uh, helped to exacerbate issues even further. It's vital. And it's vitally important that we keep that in the front of our minds and plan for it um, every 10 years when that time comes, because it does set the stage and foundation for the next decade. And that decade is crucial. I can promise you, and if we look back at prior generations, um, the amount of change that can be instituted over a 10 year period, if given the ability to stack the deck first as it pertains to um, how we count uh, and who gets congressional districts and how we deal with redistricting uh, both at the congressional level and the legislative level um, really helps to define how we run elections. Um, and 10 years worth of time, unfortunately, and as we've seen, is, is a lifetime, uh, it seems, in, in, in our nation's democracy. And so we're, we're still wrestling with that. We're still fighting back. Um, you know, what has been decades of um, just abuse to our electoral system, our democratic systems and the Republic. What's important that you guys have, there are a couple of things. One is that you all care about it. Um, I am, am happy to be in Harrisburg, happy to be on this call, um, most importantly with you all as students, because I know uh, deep down that that most of what we're wrestling with um, in our jobs today, it's part of a relay race. We're gonna you know, try our best. We're gonna run a good leg. Uh, Chairwoman Bullock is doing great stuff. So the Legislative Black Caucus will be all over this. Um, there are some amazing legislators already in Harrisburg who are fighting this fight, but there's gonna come a time when, when it's gonna be time for us to, to go uh, because you all will be ready to assume the mantle. Um, and when you are, this fight isn't going to be done yet. Um, I hope it is. I hope that we've established wonderfully clear, you know, just algorithms that identify the fairest, most compact, most appropriate legislative and congressional districts. I'm not sure that we are. And I'm not sure, most importantly, that that's going to do away with so many of the rest of the ills that you all talked about. So. Um, how we identify and define districts is vital. The work that we have in front of us and that our um, legislators are going through right now um, with regards to redistricting, um, and we'll see the outcomes of that as we uh, get into the fall, 
that's going to be major, but it's only going to be major in that it'll help to set the table for that decade's worth of a fight. And I think what we all need to make sure we take with us is we can still figure out how that fight should go, right? That fight doesn't have to be the knockdown, drag out, hyper-partisan, you know, how we've drawn districts represents who's going to win and who's going to be a clear loser for the Commonwealth, for our communities, or for the country. Um, we can still appreciate that uh, to the winner goes the responsibility to govern, right? You know, I am a, a Democrat in a heavily Democratic district, and I know all too often that it's imperative on me and it's my responsibility to be thinking also about the Republicans in my district who want, um, you know, you can go through the line of just kind of uh, what Republicans are concerned about from a partisan platform, but I also know what Republicans oftentimes are concerned about um, just from a kitchen table issue. And that's what's most important for all of us. Um, and I will tell you that the legislators that we have on here all understand this um, deep in our bones too, is um, when it comes down to the real work of governance, um, we all kind of want the same thing. Um, we've got bills and we've got work on, on funding our education and the importance of educating our students. We all want to educate our students. Uh, we've got legislation on, you know, how to keep ourselves healthy um, and how to ensure that we have a healthcare system that is robust enough to handle a pandemic. Everybody, even both sides of the aisle, wants a healthy, um, you know, government. Everybody wants to make sure that we are taken care of and that we're sound. And so, it is vitally important that we that we think about the census and that we plan around the census. And it's vitally important that uh, we draw and, and have in mind fair legislative districts. And once we've set the table, most importantly, it's vitally important that we as elected officials and you all as future elected officials think about, you know, win or lose, to the victor goes the responsibility to govern and you're governing for everybody. So uh, thank you for, for your presentation, it was amazing. Um, as was said before me, thank you guys for your work. Um, and, and I look forward to working with you guys, at least Emily, I look forward to working with you again next year. Um, and to the rest of you guys, congratulations on your pending graduations. Um, your communities are all so proud of you as, as are we in Harrisburg. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Um, Chair Bullock, would you like to comment on both? And then um, Senator Haywood. Thank you, Carmina. Um, and, and Dr. Marcel's absence, I'd like to thank him for uh, being such a, an example for these young scholars and leaders and allowing you the space to be leaders within your school districts um, and empowering you with those tools. As the chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, I just want to echo the comments from Representative Napoleon Nelson, who's also the chair of our subcommittee on budget equity. So Emily and Yasir, when you talk about funding for schools, this is definitely something we have been talking about and talking about how um, we can fund schools equitably, how we can make sure that education is at the top of our, our agenda. Um, that is definitely a part of our conversation. And we look at that, um, through the lens of not just equity, but the systemic racism that we have seen for generations in this country and understanding um, how far back it goes and how much the educational system has been built on inequities. Um, the educational system in this country, I almost compare to as education apartheid um, in the way in, in which we provide education services to um, to, to uh, Pennsylvanians and to anyone in, in this country, as a matter of fact. And then our, our chair of the subcommittee on education, Representative Regina Young, again, echoing her response and comments to, um, to your presentations. Look, these two presentations, I heard one big thing. We should have done this already, right? I mean, Yasir said it, and Sadia said it. We should have did this a long time ago. Why haven't we? Well, 
there's there's many reasons for that. But really, it's about making those hard decisions um, as legislators, as the grown-ups at the table, um, folks who want to use both of these systems, education and democracy, to control people and to maintain their own place in society. Do not be mistaken. Education and your right to vote are the two biggest promises that we were hoping for, well, folks were hoping for, because it's before my time, during the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement, we wanted to come out with access, access to government, voting rights, democracy, number one. Number two, education, I believe was one of the biggest promises of the civil rights movement that we have yet to fulfill. So in many ways, the two presentations here from Shannon and Zadia, Emily and Yasir are very much connected. And you guys did an amazing job presenting the facts, but sharing your personal stories, the burdens and the privileges of having to be the translator in your classroom uh, was really compelling as a story to share, to illustrate how this, you know, what this looks like in the classroom when we don't provide the resources that your community and your school deserves. To talk about, you know, how your experience as an intern, I can't believe you're interning for a campaign at 14, Shannon. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I didn't even know that was a possibility, <laughs> but, um, you know, just, you know, understanding that you cross the state and not a lot of folks get an opportunity to travel across the state and see what it looks like between here and Alle in Allegheny, all right? A lot of space between Philadelphia and the suburban counties in Allegheny, all right? And, um, and in, in that space is where we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we can share these stories, share your presentations and the work that you've done. You know, I'll be honest with you, presentations were great. But we've heard it before, right? We've heard it before. Somebody else gave this presentation before. Some grown-up did. Some lawyer did. Some advocate did. But for some reason, we still haven't gotten the work done that we should have done a long time ago. We should have been done this, right? So hopefully that we, you know, we, we've seen a lot of stories. We've heard a lot of conversations in the past year with the pandemic, with this country's you know, second, third, fourth awakening with his racist history and, and the need for social justice and some really great reports that came out on, you know, New York Times and the Washington Post. Everybody wanted to write about racial inequities and systemic racism. Well, hopefully we don't just put some words on a piece of paper or words on an article in social media and not put actions behind those words, right? And so this is a time the time is now, Yasir, for us to put actions behind those words and not allow another year go by with just reports, with just fancy PowerPoint slides. It's the adults' responsibility to make sure we move, move beyond that. So um, I want to congratulate you all for the work that you did. Tomorrow's a big day, and those of you who are 18, I hope that you go out and vote tomorrow, or those of you who have you know, adults in your in your circle, you push them out and make sure they vote tomorrow. It's important. Um, and, and, and I know that when you all are of age and can vote, we will be seeing you not only at the polls, but as Representative Nelson mentioned, some of us may have to watch out because you'll be coming for our seats and we'll be happy to, to give them up, to be honest. Happy to give them up for new and fresh leadership. So I want to thank you all again. Thank you, Carmina. I know that um, my colleague, Rep. Senator Art Haywood, will also be addressing you, um, and uh, so I, I will pass the Zoom baton to him. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to share a quick slide, and I hope this works. You see my slide? Thank you. So first of all, uh, thank you so much for the presentations. And you are all right that fair funding is a serious issue in Pennsylvania, has been for a long time, and there's been a fight for a long time as uh, Chairwoman Bullock raised uh, to deal with the fair funding. Also, redistricting. 
Serious problem in Pennsylvania. Yes, other places, but serious problem here in Pennsylvania as well. And there have been numerous fights over redistricting, including litigation. So I just want to share with you, first, you are right. These are serious problems. Second, this school funding issue is beyond Montgomery County. There are 501 school districts in Pennsylvania, 501. And all the school districts that you mentioned are in the top half of getting money. 250 would be half and Norristown's at 174. So we got some serious funding issues beyond just comparing one school district in Montgomery County to another. You can see here, even Cheltenham is on some one of the top schools in the state, 31st in the state in terms of public funding, well ahead of Norristown, which is 174th. So I think it's important that we look statewide not just what's happening in Montgomery County, because the financing from the legislature, Harrisburg, doesn't deal with one county at a time. Uh, we deal with 66, 67 counties. Next, you all, I believe, should focus on what I primarily focus on, power. Where do you have power and how can you apply it? So yes, you have power meeting with us in the state legislature. I, I commend you for that. You also have power in your local school district. So, Emily, you said your school district got $100 million? Was that right? I'm sorry? Did you say your school district is spending $100 million a year? Somewhere around there? If they're spending around $100 million a year, that was Shelton Senator. What Shelton was Hamm has 119, right. 119? Shelton has 119 yes, uh, uh, in their budget. And, a, and Norristown has 163. 163, is that what you said, uh, Emily? 163. If they're spending $163 million, they should be able to get teachers in the classroom who are multilingual for $163 million in terms of how they're spending the money. So you have a significant amount of influence, not just with us, but in your local district. In Cheltenham, 31st in spending in the state. How's that money being spent? Next, I did want to tell you, you should, there, are, there is an organization, Education Voters of Pennsylvania, they are advocating like mad on fair funding. I strongly encourage you to join this organization, be part of a larger group that is trying to get fair funding. This is a big opportunity for you. Also on redistricting, Fair Districts PA is the dominant civics people's organization in Pennsylvania trying to get fair districts. If you want fair districts, I strongly encourage you to use your power, join up with those who are going in a similar direction whether that's joining up with education voters or joining up with fair districts. This is how people get their power felt. They join a statewide coalition, not just a Montgomery County coalition, a statewide coalition. Because keep in mind, the state legislature, there are 67 counties. So just hearing the view of one county, obviously just not enough, which is why it's so important to join up with a statewide organization. I strongly encourage you to do so. The last point I make is you've got to vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Haywood, and thank you everyone else. Um, we just wanted to give the opportunity for the students that are on this call, or Shannon and Yasir, Emily, Sadia, and the floor is open. If you could put your, uh, unmute yourself or raise your hand if you wanna speak. And we just want you to share your voices and we can close out after that. Anybody here, uh, any of my girls and Yasir, Shannon, do you wanna say anything? Okay. Kevin, do you see anyone else over there trying to say anything? I do not. 
Well, okay. Well, listen, the purpose of tonight was really um, for all of you legislators to see what we've been up to, how we're trying to create spaces for students to share their voices. And we will be coming to the Capitol Steps uh, March 25th. We're going to um, have a reframing for justice, um, social justice experience on the Capitol Steps. We'll be meeting with some of you, getting a Capitol tour. But hopefully we'll stay, continue to stay engaged with the caucus and have opportunities to share more of what we feel is valid, our valid perspectives to share with all of the legislators in Harrisburg. And if no one else has anything else to say, we can close the night. And um, thank you for your time. This was very valuable. It was really nice meeting you, Representative Young. And um, I just want to personally thank Yasir and, and Emily and Sadia and Shannon for putting up with me as well. Um, Ms. Carmina definitely loves you for so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. We can just end on that note if no one else has anything to say. This was a valuable exercise. Ms. Taylor, hang on one second. We have one question. Okay. Mr. Gosher, uh, go ahead. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, of course, it's me. So of course. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I just like the thoughts of all of you and what had just occurred recently, um, under a month ago, Houston uh, Buford at North Penn. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about North Penn and about their lack of diversity. Um, but specifically with the hate crime that had occurred, what is the action that the Legislative Black Caucus has taken, if any, and what is the appropriate action to continue doing going forward? Are you, Don, Thank are you, you aware um, of what happened? I, I believe Rep. Nelson and Senator Haywood have been active in that particular incidents. I don't know all the details. I'm going to defer to them because I have been deferring to their leadership as these um, districts are in Montgomery County and closer to their districts than mine. Um, and however, the Black Caucus can support them and the work that they're doing um, in that space, we will. But I'll defer to them on this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, thanks so much. So uh, a few things, and Rep. Nelson has done a few things as well. <clears throat> Number one, this has been reported to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. And the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission has an investigation of the incident. It has been reported to the district attorney who is looking into the incident as, uh, as well. Obviously the Ambler NAACP is also uh, looking into the incident. Uh, those are some immediate things that are happening Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, the, uh, the Ambler NAACP, and it was reported as well to the uh, Montgomery County District Attorney. I did talk to the Attorney General for Pennsylvania as well, uh, Josh Shapiro, and if needed, he will provide help. And, and I'll, I'll throw in there um, that I, I'm kind of glad you brought this up. There are a couple quick things that I'll mention. One is we need to make sure that we um, are honest with all of us around what diversity really looks like. Um, North Penn actually is one of the most diverse school districts um, because of the number and representations of uh, individuals from different ethnicities and religions. Uh, they have a wonderfully diverse community. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the next part is sometimes diversity um, doesn't mean that we all come together and sing kumbaya in, in different in colors and languages. Um, sometimes diversity brings with it struggles and brings with it, um, you know, incidents that, that happened um, a, a few weeks ago. And, and obviously, um, you know, it, it is you know, very disheartening um, to, to say that I'm saddened by what happened would be an understatement. Um, but I also am, am to some degree understanding of what happened because of where we are um, nationally and again, the diversity that is that community. Um, it, I, I said it then and I still do, I consider it a hate crime um, because it was, uh, much of it was based on kind of a targeting of an individual's ethnicity and, and skin color. But at the same time, I know that a hate crime committed by 17-year-olds um, doesn't necessarily mean that um, those students just are full of hate and have hate in their heart. And it doesn't mean that it's the end of the story for them. So I think um, it was um, 
you know, it's a sad incident. I know that the North Penn community has uh, acknowledged that it was a sad incident, not just in what happened, but how the administration and the police kind of responded and their uh, lack of sensitivity to um, ensuring that uh, the students uh, were appropriately covered. Um, but I know that they are, you know, taking the appropriate steps and it's now on us as a community to make sure that we also take those same appropriate steps to say um, that one, a student in a community was, was significantly slighted, hurt, um, and, and harmed by this. And, and we, need to, we need to call that out and they have. But then two, that, um, that it was done by you know, kids in, in a school and that's exactly where people are supposed to learn and grow from this. So, um, you know, I, I believe that, that North Penn is moving in that, in that um, way, but it's important. It's important that we all understand that kids who commit hate crimes aren't necessarily then filled with hate and to be damned for the rest of their lives. We grow from this as a community. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kaufman, do we have any more hands up? I see one other. Kevin? No, we do not. Okay. Well, on that note, I really do appreciate everyone's time, and uh, we look forward to continue to work with you, Chair Bullock, um, Representative Young, Senator Hayward, and um, Representative Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, for being on tonight. Good night.